um, le let me just get started because I, I don't want to stand any longer be between you and uh, you know all the good stuff out there. All right, so um, first of all, a big thanks to everybody who's been here at this conference. I, I think it has been an awesome conference, like very good crowd, very good talks, very good mood. Um, and I've, I've actually seen a lot of things that excited me a lot today, starting from, you know, a presentation of completely new streaming storage technology coming up to use cases and techniques to, you know, platform my stream processing across big enterprises, different use cases from, from everything, from machine learning, anomaly detection, um, or more traditional analytics, like technology outlooks and what's coming up in Flink with things like incremental checkpointing, uh, couriable state and evolution of that and so on. So yeah, I hope, I hope everybody actually enjoyed it as much as I did. And I want to give you finally, as we're like finishing this whole thing up, um, kind of a few a few takeaways uh, takeaways from um, like a different view on some of these things that have been presented in these talks and that we've also started to see over the over the past more like half year year happening in stream processing in general and in Flink in specific. So um, the talk is called the convergence of real time analytics and event driven application. That's a mouthful, and let me actually um, like explain a little bit what I what I mean with this later. I think looking back a bit, what we can actually see is 2016 was when, when really, I think everybody started about talking about stream processing, right? I mean, stream processing has been out there also, also in the years before, but I, I had the feeling 2016, everybody was saying, yeah, that's the big thing. We, 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 gotta, we gotta worry about that. That's what, what we gotta do. And now 2017, you know, 2017 can't just do the same thing that 2016 did, right? That would be boring. So. What 2017 is actually doing is, I think, um, it's picking up stream processing, but more and more, almost in a slightly different angle, in, in an angle of, of not classical streaming analytics, but um, in an angle of applications, event-driven applications that are realized in a streaming paradigm. And let me actually explain a little more um, what, what, what that is in a bit. And, um, start off with kind of reviewing empirically a few of the cases that we've seen. So some large scale streaming applications, most of them have been actually presented here. Um, I'm also mixing in one that has not been presented here, but uh, on the Flink block a while back. So um, starting out with uh, one, of the, one of the first talks of the, uh, of the day, um, stream processing at ING for fraud detection. Um, it's a mixture of, if you wish, a classical analytical application that um, you know, that looks at, at various events, try to put them into context, try to evaluate them with models. But it's not just, it's not just putting out an analytical result, it's actually, it's actually doing something. Um, it's, it's, triggering, it's triggering actions when something happens. In, in a very similar way, another talk of the day um, presented by, by Uber, by their platform Athena X, um, Jin may actually mentioned, you know, they're, they're looking at an abstraction um, to, to add SQL to do stream processing, but after the analytical step, there's all, also uh, another step where you find certain thresholds and triggers and RPC calls that are triggered by this, which are, which are more, yeah, you hear this word coming up actually again and again, which are actually more like application, like online application sides to them. So you start out with, with classical analytics over streams and then you're reacting to, to results from these um, by, by taking, taking live actions. We've seen use cases from, from Netflix um, around uh, routing events from, from the incoming pipeline down to systems like Kafka, Elasticsearch, Hive, um, building, building things like complex sessions um, where user events, user events come and you, you try to, you know, they come in all forms of orders. You try to reorder them, put them into, into, um, into sessions and then try to aggregate them and you know, hand them, hand them to, down, to downstream systems, mixing a lot of different shapes of um, of processing types, stateless jobs, small state jobs, large scale jobs, and rolling this out as a, as a service. Um, from, from Alibaba, they had, they had two talks. They were presenting um, basically what they're using, a system called Blink, um, based on Flink. It's getting closer and closer to vanilla Flink. It started out as a, as a fork um, a year ago. It's moving closer and closer to Flink by itself. Um, which, is a, which is a big system, a big core system, Alibaba doing machine learning, um, computing, um, search results, uh, 
updating recommend recommenders used in, in testing of search uh, algorithms and basically used in, like in, in improving the conversion rates of, of search in general. Alibaba has become actually a major contributor to Flink, helping to merge a lot of these improvements back um, to, to the open source. And if you look at their, um, at their at the spectrum also that they're using, it's 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 become pretty diverse. There's machine learning, which you, which which is kind of a category of its own. There's um, there's classical, you know, more like faster computation of of results that you then then feed into search engines, but also immediately like updating updating um, like search recommenders based on based on live trends during things like you know single day shopping. And the final one, the final use case that I want to actually very briefly present to you, it's something that has not been presented at this conference, but we, we have it on the Flink blog from um, a few weeks back, is actually a group of people that built a social network on Flink, which may sound a little unorthodox if you look at it initially. Um, the three guys that you here see, some of you may, may know them, they're from, the, from, the, um, from what's now the Grand Tour on Amazon. Uh, they, they have a social network called DriveTribe, which is basically entirely built on, if you wish, Kafka, Flink, and Elasticsearch, taking the idea of like an event sourcing architecture to, to the extreme. So every time somebody does something, creates a user, joins a tribe, does a, li uh, does a recommendation or so, or like, um, something enters, enters Kafka, is picked up by Flink, and Flink basically mutates the live state of the application that is then immediately served by the web servers. So between all these examples um, that we've seen here, they, they actually span a, a pretty wide spectrum, right? And, um, what, what becomes, I guess, quite obvious in all these examples, this is not just taking something that used to be a Hadoop job or let, let's say a batch analytical job and making it a little more real time, right? This is starting to be a different category of applications that are, that are being built here. So what can we learn from this? Yes, all of them run in Flink. Big surprise is because we're on Flink forward. Yeah. But um, yeah, I already mentioned this point. We're, we're seeing more and more application characteristics starting to appear in these jobs, right? So it's, it's not only computing something, but also immediately acting on it. This is one job. It's the stream processor is becoming the point that is doing way more than just computing the count. It's actually the part where the logic runs that decides how to act on what happens if the threshold is, is, uh, is, is crossed and so on. Another, another thing that's actually maybe not so obvious from these slides from what I have been presenting here, but if you kind of uh, remember the talks and the different, the different talks about how, how different companies have been productionizing Flink, then you can actually see that there is a good part of companies using this in Hadoop. Um, I would say the correlation is these are the companies that have been actually doing a lot of batch analytics before, have started to use stream processing first to move analytics to be more real time and are then picking up more of an application angle. And there are also a lot of companies which sort of approached more from the other side. They said, okay, you know, we want to build real-time application. It just looks like streaming is a good paradigm for that. And those, those actually start outside the Hadoop stack often and are, are um, I have the feeling they gravitate more towards things like Kubernetes or Mesos or, or something like that. So that's actually another um, kind of interesting lesson learned looking at all the talks that were happening here today. So if, if streaming is, um, how can we, how can we sum it up what, what streaming is, right? It's, I, um, as I said, it's really, it's outgrowing the idea of just being faster analytics, more real-time analytics. I think looking back at the previous years, we can sort of identify three waves of streaming. The first wave being the, the Lambda architecture that has, that has, has gotten its, uh, it, I want to say, it, it's gotten a bit of a beating today. Um, it, was, it was a, a useful thing at its time, but I, I agree, like the technology has evolved. Um, the, the idea of the Lambda architecture was streaming systems, eight batch systems, to be, to be a bit more real time. The second wave was then that stream processors were maturing and that, you know, you could get away from the Lambda architecture and say, you know, the stream processor can handle everything. It's actually, it's, it's starting to be fast, it's starting to be correct and so on. So we can, we can actually do that. We, we don't have to have this dual, uh, the dual path. Um, and at the same time, as the stream processors were maturing and saying, we can keep up with batch processors just in their capability of correctness and, um, and performance, was also an evolution in the way of thinking. Um, like the, some, something that happened around the idea of the data flow model that you were saying, you know, streams are actually just a super nice primitive by themselves. You know, we don't need to think in terms of batch data sets, stream data sets, just all the streams, sometimes it's bounded and unbounded. So those, those things together, I think, fall kind of under the second wave of, of streaming. 
And the third wave is what, what I think we've, we're starting to see over the, over the last months that, um, that many users are starting to think as, of, of streaming not just as something that is really coming out of the data space from a data team that's doing analysis and it's doing fast analysis. It's really something that is used as a paradigm for, for the teams that, that build direct online applications. And um, why, why, why do users do that, right? I mean, all of a sudden, it's not like it's a new thing to build applications. Application has, applications have been built for as long as there have been computers. So why all of a sudden the gravitation towards the streaming paradigm? So it just turns out that streaming is a very nice match for the characteristics of many applications, especially if you're looking at event-driven applications. And let me actually briefly qualify what I think are um, what, what users like in, in building, or what users think about when they build event-driven application today and why, why the streaming architecture is such a nice match for that. So event-driven applications in their core are, this is kind of a flinkish view on it, you, you, you'll actually see that, but are, are applications that I think are, are built around, around these concepts, event, state, time, and snapshots. So if you, if you want to build an application that reacts to events happening in the world, the, th the first thing that you need is you know, some form of compute, some form of functionality, something that reacts whenever something happens. You write this piece of function and you want to, you know, you want to spread it out, execute it in parallel. Um, it's not a new invention, right? It has been around the, you know, has been, um, has been known under the name of also like reactive programming, event-driven programming, uh, actor-based programming. Something um, that, that you definitely need if you start um, to make a lot of, if, if you want to implement complex applications, is you want, you want state associated with that. Um, state has to be if you run it at large scale, if you run, to, if you run it fault tolerant, um, sorry, if you run it large scale and distributed, state has to be fault tolerant. It has to be able to look to the application almost like it is a local state, like you're, you're working in, in an object with a variable, but it doesn't disappear. When something goes down, it comes up somewhere and it, it recovers a view that is completely consistent. So that is one of the things that I think Flinked is really nice. This, this ability to give you access in a very flexible way to state and make sure that this state um, is around and is around in, in a consistent way. The next ingredient in, in many of these applications that we're, that we're seeing is actually time. And so time, time in actually various incarnations. Time in the notion of wall clock time, you know, just, just real time that makes progress, but also time as event time. And event time has kind of uh, become very, very popular also as in the second wave of streaming when, you know, you were talking about streams with event time windows and so on. But event time is actually, is actually vastly uh, useful also out, outside the notion of just thinking in high level of streams and windows and so on. So we, we're seeing actually a lot, of, um, a lot of interest in these more lower level primitives in Flink where you directly actually just manage, manage timers, also event time timers yourself. Let me, let me give you an example that is, I think, Jamie's favorite example in explaining that. Um, so, so imagine you're, um, you're, in, you're in a function and you're, you're processing different inputs that you see about, about a user coming from, you know, from different points and they can be totally out of order. And at some point in time, you see an event that kind of indicates that you know, this user interaction is done. It's kind of a session logout. Um, you cannot really, in many cases, if you're dealing with out of order events, what you cannot do is immediately say, okay, let me sum up everything that I've seen and sort of give a statistics down, a statistic downstream, because you actually may be missing still some part of the data. But what you can do is you can just say, okay, so this logout occurred at point N in event time. So let me actually schedule a callback that exactly when time N in event time is reached, I actually get this thing back again. And then I handle it because then I'm actually sure that I've seen everything that is relevant to that user. So you can you can actually start using event time in like with flexible event time callbacks as well in in very low level primitives. That's a very useful thing there. And then the final thing, it's less of an API thing. It's more of an operational thing. Is the ability to draw to draw consistent snapshots, both of if you wish, individual states, but the real power in Flink comes that these snapshots are coordinated and give you a consistent view of all the different functions and states and points in time that the entire computation is in at the specific point in time when you do the snapshot. And, and this snapshot is an immensely powerful thing by itself, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great primitive both for recovery. We've actually seen that, that uh, users use it to move between um, spot instance clusters just to wherever it's cheaper to, <laughs> to currently run your comput computation and still, still keep consistency. 
or to, yeah, to just use this for manageability upgrading, um, upgrading frameworks and code. So if, if I were kind of to, to draw a bit of, a, of an application space diagram in, in Flink today, it, it might look some, somewhat like that. Um, at the core, Flink is about stateful event-driven event time aware processing. Those are, in fact, actually the primitives that have always been under the hood of Flink. Functions that get executed, access to, um, access to consistent state that is snapshotted for you, access to event time that is tracked, the distributed progress of event time is tracked by Flink, and then, you know, everything else is on top of that. And while we were actually initially giving more attention to the high level, um, high level view on that, which is stream processing, you abstract this a level up into streams. So you're not thinking of individual events, but collections of events in their, in their, in their, in their stream in order as they're coming in. You're thinking not about reacting to each individual event, but you're just defining what should happen. You know, what view of events do you want, like counts per hour and so on. This was kind of the first abstraction that we're exposing, but we're actually more and more exposing the, the even lower level aspects of Link because they seem to be very attractive for these like more, for the, for the users that build more specific applications and more control of what, what actually happens with each individual event. You're treating each event, individual event different from, from the others based on your contextual state and time. And then, of course, batch processing, as batch processing is a special case of streaming, bounded streams, special case of the unbounded streams, is a, is a different view on stream processing. So in order, to, um, in order to, to support that, Flink is actually offering more APIs to, to allow users to actually work with the levels that kind of fit their, their problem better. So on the lowest level, we've introduced in Flink 1.2, um, a very low level API called the, the process function, which gives you exactly these raw ingredients, events, state, and time. And I think it's actually the most, uh, the, like the, the features where we get the most feedback about like, okay, wow, this is what, what we were looking for. It's, 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 in, it's incredible, if, if you wish. Um, we're just like not masking complexity anymore. Like you, you would say it's the opposite thing that, that happens usually, right? Usually you try to add features where you hide complexity, but this is actually the opposite where everybody is asking us, no, 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 please expose the complexity. I really want to define what should happen in my application. On top of this, this very low level um, abstraction is the data stream API thinking about streams and windows. And on, and on top of that are um, our coming APIs or the APIs have been around for a bit, but they're getting more and more powerful for um, working, um, working with tables like relation of views on data and, and stream SQL. I've been actually uh, some talks on, on that. And yeah, so you, you can actually see the, all, all of these abstraction levels, they're kind of just different, differently abstracted views on the same thing. And they, they lend themselves to different use cases, like low level applications, um, complex streaming analytics, um, more, more high level abstract streaming analytics. And we can, we can briefly actually see how, how code gets more and more uh, or gets, is more flexible on the lower layers and gets more succinct on the higher layers. So process function has almost, almost literally these, um, these ingredients here, declarations of state, declarations of how to handle elements, declarations of, of what to do in time, and the ability to interact with, you know, with context to access time, um, schedule things, emit elements at any point in time, and um, access and mutate state at any point in time. The data stream API looks a lot more succinct if you just want to express very simple, um, if you want to express, yeah, not very simple, but streaming analytics that fit this model of streams as distributed collections, windows, transformations, and so on very well. And you can go in a, another level up, the table API, if you, if you really want highly abstracted um, relational data processing. And of course, this is extens extensible with UD, um, user-defined functions, user-defined aggregation and table functions. So you can actually also extend that level again a little bit. And the interesting thing is you can also navigate between all of these levels within the same program, right? You can start out with a data stream, convert it into a table, do some relational analytics. Um, the result uh, is a data stream on which you can run a process function. So you can actually in the same application navigate these levels. All right, so there, there are the ingredients actually in, in, in the stream processor to build, um, to build applications. But why is that actually interesting to do it like that? Um, why not just stick with, with what has been around? 
Um, to, to give you an overview of that, let me, let me just look at, let me just contrast these two architectures on, on a very high level and, and see how, how things behave a bit different than if you, if you do it in a, let's say, in, in a very, let's say, traditional architecture versus a very streaming way of doing it. So in a classic tiered architecture, what you would, what you would often have is a stateless compute layer and a stateful database layer. And the, you know, the, the compute would just run the code and every time you interact with, with state or so, you'd interact with the database. You'd look up something from the database and if you would do a mutation, you would mutate the state in the database. And the database would almost take on a dual role, right? It would hold both the working set of the application and also long-term persistence of state. In the streaming architecture, you kind of split these things very explicitly where you say um, compute and state go strictly together and all, all state, uh, all state mut uh, mutation is is local and the storage becomes something that is just like for the change log for the or for the input stream and for backup of your of your internal state. If you if you compare, for example, how just basic writes work, right? In the in the classic tiered architectures, every write kind of crosses a tier boundary, it's a remote operation. If you compare this to to in a in a flank streaming architecture where every write is a strictly process local operation, all operations across boundaries, uh, tier boundaries, are asynchronous writes of very large blobs. And this is all coordinated by something like, like Flink's checkpoint uh, algorithm. The nice notion of this checkpoint algorithm is that it supports this, um, this ability to, to basically just take a point in time view and asynchronously materialize it and still, you know, still keep a completely consistent view. So there's no, there's no need for synchronous transactions. Which brings us to the next um, to the next kind of step. If you if you're building a distributed architecture in the in this classic tiered architecture, what you usually do as it gets slightly more uh, complex, you, you either deal with distributed transactions or you have to come up with a model if you want to make it really scalable to to do an at most once or at least once trade off because at some point distributed transactions become a hard thing. The the streaming architecture gives you a, a very a very natural, I think, consistency model also where like per state locally you get exactly one semantics. And if you actually look across individual states, you're you're not getting like you're not getting something like transactional serializability, but you're getting something that is that is like database snapshot isolation semantics, right? So in at, at each point in time when you're taking a snapshot across cer certain states, then then the mutations triggered by it, an input event are either reflected in all of them or in none of them. So it's it's kind of like a like a snapshot isolation consistency model. If you if you scale if you scale an application in this uh, in this model, right? I mean, assume you're still in the in the in the world of you know like application servers and so on with your state uh, stateless compute containers. Every time you scale it out, you you sort of have to also make sure that the database has the additional capacity to handle that. Whereas if you scale out uh, an application and the streaming architecture, you basically simply get the, the additional capacity for state provisioned um, as, as you add new instances, new parallel instances. And almost the same holds for deploying a new service, right? It, it doesn't really make a big difference if the new containers you roll out actually belong to a different application to the same application. Whereas if you actually have to manage a central data store, it becomes a tricky thing. For, I mentioned this before, time is actually something that is often, um, often not overlooked in what the, um, in how important it is in building these, these applications. I put a question mark in how to handle time in this, in this architecture, like distributed um, event time progress. I'm not talking about wall clock time, so this is not about synchronization of individual clocks, but about event time, event time being kind of an indicator of of progress, of completeness of data, right? I mean, having reached a certain point in event time is an indicator that you're at least heuristically complete for all data that is belonging to time before that, which is a, is a very powerful information to have, right? In a, in a streaming architecture, tracking event time comes quite natural, right? With streams and watermarks and so on. So you know, you know, the, you know the dependencies, you know the graphs, how the, how the data flows, you know. Um, you can insert, if you can at any point in time determine progress like uh, at the sources by generating watermarks, then everything downstream will just like completely naturally figure out its own progress in event time. It's a, it's a very natural match. And the last thing, which is maybe not so obvious, but I think it's actually a very interesting aspect to it. Um, assuming we're dealing with, um, with an application that, you know, it, it consumes, um, it consumes events and, uh, it, it, 
it computes something, it has its own local state, but it's also mutating some external state. And let's say at some point there was corrupt data in the streams, or there was something wrong in the computation, and you actually managed to, you just have some wrong results in your external state that you produced. How do you repair it? Um, you could, of course, just roll back this whole thing to a prior save point and let it go through and compute everything again, but that's actually not quite that feasible in many cases because the live thing has to keep running, right? So what is really interesting in the way of, of building applications following a streaming ar architecture is that you can, you can just bring up a copy of that thing and, and give it, um, give it a, a backup of the data. So if you're in this, let's say in the current world where you have your live data in HDFS, you have some backup in S3, or you know, as soon as we have ProVega, we may not have to do that distinction anymore. Um, where you just have, you have the live data and the historic data, you can just bring up a copy of that ap application and actually give it that other input. And something that's maybe not that well known in Flink, but it's actually a pretty cool characteristic is, every streaming job can actually behave completely as a finite job, right? If you give it, if you give it an infinite input, it will actually keep running and you know, keep, keep waiting for this input to give it data. If you actually give the exact same program a finite input, like you point it not to, to, to a message queue, but you point it to a static file, it will run this and it will go away. It will behave exactly like a batch job. So in some sense, you, you can almost say that every service, you're, every application you're implementing doubles as a batch job to repair itself to, like over its historic data. And I think that's a fairly, that's a fairly powerful thing. And if you take all of these things together, together I, I think you're, you're getting, a, a, yeah, you're getting a pretty powerful picture. And it explains why I think the stream processing par paradigm is actually starting to be a lot more a lot more attractive, not just for, for fast analytics, for something that used to be a batch and you now want it more real time, but why, why somebody would actually implement a social network on a stream processor. It doesn't sound like all that crazy anymore, right? It actually sounds like, wow, this is a forward thinking, really, really powerful thing. Why, why don't we just do it exactly like that in the future? And yeah, with that, I actually want to conclude this, um, this closing session and, and leave it like that, yeah? All right, thank you. Thank you.